Okay, long story. When I was 19, I moved out of my parents' house and got an apartment. It was in a relatively safe neighborhood, but still affordable. One bedroom, one bath, very modest, nothing fancy. Anyways, I was on the second floor above an old man who couldn't hear anything and below a couple in their early 20s who fought and screamed all the fucking time. And when they weren't fighting, they took turns having loud, obnoxious sex in the wee hours of the morning. One day, boyfriend gets violent and the cops take him away. Girl continues living there, but she comes down to let me know that he's gone, and because I was a relatively big guy then. She says he's not supposed to come by, but can I have your number in case he does? This was before cell phones, so I gave it to her. I should mention that I have a girlfriend, Sue, at this time, and she did not like upstairs girl, Jen. Anyway, Jen calls me one night before midnight. Are you okay, I ask? Yeah, what are you doing? She asks. Going to bed? I have to work at 7. I work early. Wanna come and fuck me? She says, very direct. Uh, I have a girlfriend, Jen. Talk to you later. Two hours later, she calls and wakes me up. She's crying. Why don't you think I'm attractive? Why don't you want to fuck me? I saw your girlfriend and she's fat. Why don't you want to fuck me? I swear I won't tell anybody, but you have to break up with her. It won't work. She doesn't love you like I do. Keep in mind, all these words are coming out at lightning speed, and she was drunk. She kept prattling on like that. I couldn't get a word in edgeways. Finally, I just hang up on her. 30 seconds later, she's banging on my door. I decide to ignore it. She starts yelling. It's almost 2 AM. She's screaming, crying, banging on the door. I do the only thing that I can think of. I call the police. They say it'll be 45 minutes. It took them an hour and she banged on the door, screamed, and cried the entire time. They took her back to her apartment and calmed her down. An officer takes a statement. He keeps asking, was she ever in this apartment? And questions like that. At no point did you allow her to enter this premises. She'd never ever been inside my place. She told the cops a very different story, that we'd been intimate that I kicked her out in the middle of sex without her keys or her wallet. I told the cops that he was free to search. He looked around for 10 minutes, seemed satisfied, and then thanked me and left. At this point, it's nearly 4 a.m. 4.30 rolls around and she calls me and wakes me up. She's apologizing, she's crying, she's so sorry she got like that, but she just misses him so much. At this point, I tell her I think it's a bad idea that we talk anymore. I tell her I understand how hard it is, but that I'm going to miss work and I can't afford to miss a day's pay. She seems to get that and hangs up. I go to work after getting maybe two hours of sleep in total. I'm a zombie all day. I get home at 4.30, ready to crash. Soon my girlfriend was going to bring dinner by after she got off work at 8. I have 4 hours or so to sleep. My apartment seems spotless. Better yet, they vacuumed and I don't even own one yet. There are freshly made cookies on the table. Sue must have gotten off early, I think. Sue, I say, and walk to the bedroom. There, of course, is Jen. Naked except for thigh-high socks and her hair tie, lying on her back. And as I come in, she pulls her knees up to her shoulders and smiles at me and says, Shove your fucking cock in me until I cry. I turn around and run out of my own apartment, scared like a little boy. I would have run all the way to the office, but I was in terrible shape, so I walk. I walked into the lobby and called the police again. They came and arrested her, charged her with minor things like B and E or trespassing, forget which, and she spends a couple nights in jail since her parents or friends didn't bail her out. Behavior like this happens for weeks. 
I have some friends stay at my house, including Sue, during this time, so I'm never alone because I'm worried she's crazy and might do something weird. She consistently knocks on the door and argues with the people staying at my place. She offers to share me with Sue, offers to go down on Sue, then eventually tries to get Sue to leave me and move in with her and that they'll be like a lesbian Bonnie and Clyde. A week or two later, she is being evicted. I guess they were late on paying rent already by like two months. An eviction had begun. And as some form of weird protest, she paints her upper torso and face bright pink with some kind of body paint and wears a green bikini top as they drag her kicking and screaming out of the place. Police end up arresting her again for something. My six month lease is up and I'm uncomfortable with her knowing where I live, so I move. I get an unlisted number and address. I am about 10 miles from my old place. A couple months after I move in, there's a knock at the door on a Sunday afternoon. It's Jen. She followed me from my work during the week, then waited until Sue left, and now she wanted to apologize. She says she's medicated, she wants to apologize, I tell her I can't let her in, and she needs to leave. I tell her I hope that she's better, but I cannot let her in. Predictably, she goes nuts. Another call to the cops as I lean on my door to keep her from pushing it in. Another arrest. For a while I didn't hear from her. Six months, a year. I moved three states over, broke up with Sue unrelated to this, and was single. It's been about three to four years and suddenly I get a MySpace friend request from her. I ignore it. Then I get a tirade of emails, long-winded, lacking punctuation, stream of consistencies, clearly mentally ill. I just ignore them. What else can I do? This is about 2002. It dies down a bit. 2005, I hear back from her on Facebook. Same thing. I ignore it again. 2006, Sue messaged me out of the blue. Haven't talked to her in like eight years. She says Jen had come to her work and wanted info on me where I was and what I was doing. She was dragged out by security. 2008, Jen finds my little brother's Facebook while he's in college, makes a road trip across three states to find him at school, finds his dorm, and goes to talk to him. He has no idea who she is. She threatens him. He and two of her friends kick her out of the dorm. He calls. I explain. He calls the cops. They do nothing. Six months later, she accosts him at work, a bar. His boss, a female, punches her square in her mouth during a fight to get her out of the building and Jen loses two teeth. She sues the bar, the owner countersues, and Jen is found mentally incompetent and placed under a form of mental hold in a facility. 2012, Jen is out of a mental institution and heavily medicated. Her counselor contacts me on Facebook. Would I like to put her past behind her, she asks. She wants to set up a face-to-face. -face. I have a wife. I have a kid. I say no thank you. The counselor gets very frustrated and tells me I'm a terrible person. 2013. Jin commits suicide by jumping off a cliff somewhere in Arizona. Her body is found months after the fact and identified by the contents in her wallet. Part of me wonders what I did to cause this. I literally never did anything out of the ordinary or said anything out of the ordinary to her. I was just her downstairs neighbor for a couple of months by the time this started and it caused over a decade of fixation. Mental illness is a hell of a thing. I recently moved out and I already have a horror story to tell. The house I moved into isn't anything impressive. It's just a house that's appropriate for one or two people. But I say right away I started hearing weird sounds coming from inside the walls. 
I first heard it in the kitchen, and then in the bathroom, but on night three I started hearing it in my bedroom. I was sure that there was some kind of animal living in the walls. I just had to figure out how to get rid of it. The next morning, I didn't even have enough milk to fill a bowl of cereal. I couldn't believe I hadn't realized I needed more milk. In fact, I had been eating up all my foods pretty fast. I woke up in the middle of the night to hear the sound of breathing. Not my breathing. It sounded just like the breath of a person. I flipped the lamp on and it stopped. I chalked it up as my mind playing tricks on me before waking up. The next day, it was so hot, I turned on the AC for the first time. I checked every single vent, and some of them weren't blowing any air. One of them being the vent right next to my bed. I ended up looking through the vent with a flashlight. There wasn't a duct at all, just the inside of the wall. Unfortunately, I didn't look into the AC system while buying the house. That night, I had to sleep in the heat with no AC, so I was up pretty late rolling around. Then I hear the breathing again, but this time I was fully awake. It was coming from the left by the air vent. The sound was surely coming from there. I shined the flashlight in through the vent. I dropped the flashlight and screamed. There were eyes looking back at me. I screamed all the way out of the house. I soon found out that there was a crazy homeless guy living in my walls who had been eating my food while I slept. I am 22 and this incident happened a year and a half ago. I had just moved into my first apartment and was in the process of moving in. The door that led into my apartment locks automatically when closed. So I was in the entrance of the complex to get my mail while talking on the phone with my boyfriend. I returned to the apartment and sat on the bed while opening the mail. I dropped the phone on the floor and it landed under the bed. So I lie on the floor and stretch for it. I saw something that caught my eye. There was someone under my bed. My eyes widen and I choke the urge to scream. The person under my bed was lying still with his back towards me and his head resting in his chest. So I couldn't see his face. And he didn't see me. Trying to be rational while so many thoughts rushed through my head. I pick up the phone and said... Sorry, I dropped my phone. I'm gonna take a shower and I'll call you back. The bathroom is right by my bed, so I hastily walk in, quietly lock the door, turn the shower on and jump out the window. My apartment is on the first floor and call the police. They told me to wait nearby, but I go across the street to see if anybody comes out the door. This was during the summer and it was still light out. I place myself across the street, hiding behind a car while waiting watching my open window and the entry to the complex. I called my boyfriend and he came to me just before the police. I gave them my keys and they went inside. Only moments later, two cops came out holding a thin and tired looking man. His eyes looked crazy, but he didn't try to get away. They told me that the man stood outside my bathroom door with one of my kitchen knives waiting for me to come out. This man had somehow crept in my entry door while I was getting my mail and hid under the bed. The man that was trying to hurt me turned out to be a homeless person and was placed in a mental hospital. My boyfriend moved in with me the very next day. This was in the middle of the summer, and my parents had left for the weekend 
to go to our house in Cape Cod. It's about a two hour drive away, so it's no big deal for them to leave me home for a few days. My mom had made me some pulled pork and pasta to heat up whenever, and I had some money if I wanted to order a pizza. Things were all good. The first night I was alone, I stayed up until 3 in the morning playing Xbox, so I woke up really late the next day. I checked my phone when I woke up and saw it was a little past 1. I had made plans to play some street hockey with some friends at 3, so I threw myself out of the bed and stumbled into the shower. I take really long showers, so when my parents are gone, I go mental. I was in there for 45 minutes when I heard my front door open. The bathroom is directly up the stairs from the back door, and the thing is pretty loud when it opens and closes. I immediately freeze, since obviously I was supposed to be alone. I waited for about two minutes, ear trained, and trying to hear anything else. Nothing. I figured it was the wind, or maybe my parents were home early. So I turned off the shower, wrapped a towel around myself, and slowly walked down the stairs to check it out. So the stairs to the kitchen, where the back door is, are pretty tight and walled in. So I can't see into the kitchen when I walk down. Even though my house is old as shit and each step on the stairs makes a super loud creak, I still took my time and tried to be as quiet as possible. I probably took 45 seconds walking down all 12 of the stairs. So when I get to the second to last stair, right before I could see around the corner into the kitchen, I take a little breath to compose myself. In my mind, I knew I was being stupid. There obviously wasn't anybody in the kitchen. There's no way I wouldn't have heard another noise. And there's no reason for them to still be in the kitchen, even if there were burglars or something in the house. After sort of mentally chastising myself for being a wuss, I sort of chuckle to myself for being so stupid and just normally walk the last two stairs and turn the corner into the kitchen. Standing about two feet away from me in the middle of the kitchen is a man staring straight at me, perfectly still, with a massive smile across his face, just staring at me. The thing I remember most vividly wasn't his face or his smile, but his arms. They weren't just at his side. He held them in the strangest, most abnormal position I've ever seen. They were where one would normally hold their arms, but he had rotated them to the point where they were almost completely reversed as well as lifted them up behind him. I don't know why I remember this so much, but it's just the most demonic, abnormal position I have ever seen. Honest to God, I thought I almost had a heart attack right there. Looking back, I realized how fucking creepy the situation was, but in the moment, I just took a step towards him and punched him as hard as I could in the jaw, sort of half slapping, half pushing him towards the ground. The second I connected, I beelined up the stairs, dropping my towel in the kitchen with my heart beating out of control. I fucking sprinted into my room and locked the door behind me. I quickly put a chair up against the doorknob like you see in TV. Almost without thinking, I immediately called 911, and nearly in tears, told the operator what happened. As I sat on the floor of my room, in practically the fetal position, staring at the door praying that a cop would just come here soon, I noticed the light coming from the gap between my door had stopped. The fucker was standing outside my door. There's no words to describe the feeling I had. I was paralyzed with fear, watching the shadow across the bottom of the door shift in tiny ways. I stayed balled up staring at the gap, praying the man would just go away. For what seemed like an hour, all while the 911 operator was asking, Hello? Sir? Are you there? Hello? I didn't want to make a noise, and even if I wanted to move my arm to bring the phone up to my mouth, 
I don't think I could have. Eventually, the light returned to the gap, and I heard the faintest of footsteps slowly creak the wooden floorboards as he walked down the hall. It was silent for minutes as I just sat there curled up, unable to speak. I heard banging on the front door and the sound of two officers entering my house. I finally felt safe, and I opened the door to two of them standing there. I almost cried. Nowadays my parents don't even leave me home alone anymore, thank God, and I check every lock on the door before going to bed. I still get nightmares occasionally, and my heart starts racing whenever I see someone standing still. But I'm doing alright. Even working with sketch artists and lineups, the police never found whoever the fuck was in my house. That sends shivers down my spine every time I look outside, half expecting to see him standing across the street smiling under a lamp post. I have no idea what he wanted, or who he was. But regardless, let's never meet again.